from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston, and welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We begin in Japan, where Prime Minister Shinzo Abe surprised even some members of his own party when he announced overnight that he is resigning. Mr. Abe has been the longest-serving prime minister in his country's history, and he spoke earlier. I'm not ready to respond to the mandate by the public. And I made a judgment. I should not continue my job as a prime minister. I decided to step down as a prime minister. Mr. Abe will be staying on as leader until his party picks a successor. Welcome now, Sheila Smith, Senior Fellow for Japan Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. So, Sheila, thank you so much for being with us. This is a surprise to us. Was it a surprise to you? Thank you for having me. I think we, we were beginning to see it coming a few weeks ago when he was obviously not well and, and last week, of course, paid a, a visit to the hospital. He's had health issues in the past that he's largely managed and managed well during this tenure as prime minister, um, but he resigned abruptly last time he was prime minister in 2007 because of this health condition. So as we said, he's the longest serving prime minister in Japan history, but more than that, he was quite influential, I have the sense. And one of the ways that Bloomberg's concerned about it was with Abenomics. He came in with those right. three arrows, those famous three arrows. Right. W were that, was that a success in retrospect, and will it continue? I think it's a it's a, it's a mixed bag. I'll, I'll leave it to the economists to, to to delve into the details. But there's two pieces I think that are worth noting here about what he did manage to accomplish, and one of them was the stru one of the structural reforms. He was he and his government were very uh, impressive in agricultural reform. One of the structural impediments to participating in the TPP or the now CPTPP, the Regional Trade uh, Pact. He tried to increase women's participation in the economy. I think some people would have liked to have seen more women, uh, but he ma he managed to make some strides there. Uh, and I think he 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 made some some slight progress in in the labor market reforms that he tackled, but he didn't really accomplish what most Japanese wanted, which is to see their wages increase. So it's a mixed bag, I think. The structural side, of course, takes time. Uh, and his legacy will be that he he tackled some of these bigger issues, got things started. And it was, of course, because of a health reason. It wasn't by choice, apparently, by Mr. Abe. At the same time, this is a pretty tricky time, not just for Japan, for governments around the world as we try to deal with this pandemic. Right. Now, here it is. And I think the coronavirus really derailed uh, what was a fairly uh, planned out succession process by Abe and the leaders of the LDP. Um, you know, the coronavirus, obviously, this may be one of the first casualties of the coronavirus that really has broad global impact. He wanted to, of course, go out on the successful 2020 Olympics, which have now been postponed for till next year. His economy, all of the kind of economic performance indicators were already in trouble coming into 2021. GDP was not, uh, it was a little anemic, right? This has just catapulted Japan into a very different, difficult position in terms of long-term economic growth. And of course, what's going on in the global economy? Um, this is not a time for Japan to, to sit back and watch. It needs to be an activist Japan is required. And so I think this is really going to, this is, must be personally painful for Mr. Abe, but it also undermines some of his key ambitions as, as leader of Japan. And Japan is so geopolitically important in the world. I mean, it's the third largest economy. It's also located literally as one of sometimes figuratively between China and the United States. Right. I think therein lies Mr. Abe's legacy, clearly, is that he managed to get some very uh, important legal reforms that would allow Japan to militarily and respond to some of the geostrategic sh shifts in the region that were not in Japan's favor. So he, he has gotten a lot on the docket for Japan's self-defense forces that another prime minister not as well politically positioned wouldn't have been able to do. And, of course, it's important to remember he managed the U.S.-Japan alliance very successfully through his kind of unprecedented personal approach to Donald Trump. That's not a small accomplishment for a country like Japan that depends so strongly on the United States' nuclear deterrent uh, when you have nuclear uh, China, of course, but you also have a new nuclear power in North Korea. One of the hallmarks of Mr. Abe's uh, uh, leadership was the close coordination between the central bank and fiscal policy. They really had the two go hand in glove. Was that right. specific to Mr. Abe? Was that something particularly with perhaps Mr. Kuroda? Or would that be likely to continue, in your opinion? 
So I think it's likely to continue. I think you saw in Mr. Kuroda the kind of culmination of a, a de maybe a decade or so of thinking about the role of the J Japanese Central Bank. Um, and I think you saw Mr. Kuroda try to take uh, the, the the Bank of Japan as far as he could in terms of quantitative easing. I think you know the inflation rate is a key indicator here, um, and I think our, what's going on in the global economy is going to be as a, as influential in terms of Japan's choices as the policy set by the central bank. At the same time, uh, demographics play a very large role here, and uh, a shrinking working population cannot be a good thing structurally. I, I guess right. that part of the reason to bring women more into the workforce was to address that need. Yes, I and mean, so I think this is the lar largest challenge, I think, over over time for Japan. Its demographics are not deterministic in, in terms of completely, but they are a f major factor in long-term growth prospects. And so one of the pieces of that structural reform package that was difficult, and uh, I mentioned it earlier, was labor labor market reforms. I think if you talk to any economist sitting in the major institutes in Tokyo, they say you you need to free up the impediments to, to an open uh, labor market in Japan, and those are structural, right? The, corp, the structure of Japanese companies, lifetime employment, et cetera. And so women was one of the pieces of that puzzle. The second piece, of course, is immigration. Unless you open up Japan to a much more free flow of workers, laborers across different sectors, um, if you don't let that kind of market reform take place, then you are, in fact, going to have an impediment that the demographics is going to, in fact, impact heavily. So I think the next prime minister and the next prime minister after that, perhaps, are going to have to deal with this question of labor, labor market reform. Okay, Sheila, thank you so very much for your time today. That's Sheila Smith with the Council on Foreign Relations. Coming up, the conventions are over, so let the race really begin. We talk with not one, but two renowned political strategists, Rick Davis and Frank Luntz, about what comes next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. In a new term as president, we will again build the greatest economy in history, quickly returning to full employment, soaring incomes, and record prosperity. This is a life-changing election. This will determine what America is going to look like for a long, long time. Character is on the ballot. Compassion is on the ballot. Decency, science, democracy. Where we fought for free and fair trade, and this president stood up to China and ended the era of economic surrender. Joe Biden has been a cheerleader for communist China. We can do better and deserve so much more. We must elect a president who will bring something different, something better, and do the important work. We saw a stark contrast between Democrats and Republicans over the last two weeks, as you got a taste of right there. For an initial take on where these sharp differences will take us in this election, we welcome now Bloomberg political contributor Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital, who's been with us each step of the way through the two convention weeks. So, Rick, thanks so much for being here. And looking at this, there is just you couldn't have a bigger difference between these two parties and what they've said over the last two weeks. But I wonder how it's going to resonate with the American people and what really is uppermost in their mind. A lot of them are very anxious about where we are economically, where we are with the virus, things like that. Which approach is going to appeal to them more? Well, I think both of them were talking to uh, uh, one group that's the same and, and, and their bases. Uh, each candidate did their best to uh, fire up their base. They, they gave them the red meat they needed, uh, and both did a good job at that. I think all four candidates on the ballot uh, did their part to fire up their base. Everybody was focused on white suburban voters as the swing group in this campaign. Uh, Biden more on those swing voters in the in the uh, in the suburbs who abandoned Donald Trump in 2018 uh, and trying to get them. And Donald Trump, who was trying to get some of those back in his speech, a lot of that resonates around uh, the crime issue. And Donald Trump taking the the point of view of law and order. And the Biden campaign taking the point of view that we need to solve the social justice problems that are uh, racking uh, our, our country and pulling it apart. 
So each of them had a different approach, but they were all targeting the same group. And I guess my question is, do we have any sense of where the American people are? Because I'll give you two facts. I believe they're facts in polling, which is when it comes to law and order, people tend to trust the Republicans more. When it comes to dealing with the coronavirus, people tend to trust the Democrats more. Yeah, and I don't think that that's at all debatable. The question is, what are they willing to vote for? Uh, Neither candidate really gave those same targeted voters uh, particularly good prescriptions for the future. Uh, On the the case of uh, COVID and the solutions for that, uh, Donald Trump talked as if it was in the rearview mirror, as if it was already over. Uh, When Joe Biden addressed it, he said it was his number one priority the first day in office, and he was going to create a mask mandate. Uh, And so, so is that a solution that everyone's working on, or is it just reinforcing the notion that that one party represents a the health party and the other the law and order party. Uh, the reality is nobody knows how those suburban splits are going to happen uh, or how articulate the rest of the campaign is going to be in finding things, whether it's economics, whether it's health care, whether it's COVID, whether it's law and order, that will then pull them into the direction of the campaign. And in a lot of the targeted states, they will make the difference as to who wins those states. Okay, Rick, as always, it's such a pleasure to have you with us as Rick Davis, our Bloomberg political contributor. Throughout his career, Frank Luntz has been the man whom campaigns and the media have turned to to understand the American electorate, often through interpretation of polls and his focus groups. He is the founder of Luntz Global, and we welcome him back now to Bloomberg. So, Frank, thanks so much for being with us. Let's pick up on where we were with Rick Davis. Uh, Often uh, elections really are as much about the people and where the people are and who they are as they are about the candidates. Do you have a sense of where the American people are right now? Yes, they have to make a tough choice. You've got 94% of the country, and that's a lot, who've made up their minds and they're not going to change. You've only got 6% who are undecided, truly undecided. And this is going to be a battle between Joe Biden's agenda and Donald Trump's persona. All you're going to hear from Trump over the next 65 days is why Joe Biden is too left-wing, socialist, or anarchist, which is the first time we heard that word last night. And from the Biden campaign, you're just going to hear that Donald Trump is a horrible person, he's been a horrible leader, and they're going to attack him for his character traits. So you're going to have two separate focal points of the campaign. One person will be talking policy, the other one will be talking character and attributes. And I can't tell you at this point which side the American people choose. Uh, how critical is it to Joe Biden at this point that he figure out a way to respond to Donald Trump? Because there's no question Donald P- Trump is a great puncher. The question in my mind is, Joe Biden a good counterpuncher? Well, I'm looking at, the, it was, since you're doing a boxing analogy, I'll, all I can think of is Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, hmm. where Muhammad Ali took blow after blow after blow for round after round, tiring out George Foreman, and finally he drops Foreman at the end because Foreman just couldn't fight back anymore. I believe the key to this is women married with school-aged children who are more concerned about the health and safety of their family than they are about reopening the schools and reopening the economy. They're the ones who are most likely to be undecided. They're the ones who don't like either candidate for various reasons. Those are the people who these two candidates should be focused on. And I'll tell you that up to this point, the persona, the character, and attributes of a candidate have mattered more. This election may be different because we got a healthcare crisis, we got a COVID crisis, we got an economic crisis, and a social justice crisis. We've never gone into election with so many challenges in the last 50 years. And so just maybe this time, policy will trump persona, uh, personality. It's fascinating. When you talk about the health and safety, those uh, married women with children, consider the health and safety of their families, does that make potentially incidents like what we've seen in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the ongoing unrest there, and before that, Minneapolis, other places, that actually make that much more potentially important come Election Day? You're, You're correct. But the problem with the president, because he's the one who's talking about it, is that when he talks about Joe Biden saying nothing, that's powerful. But Donald Trump communicates law and order, and I heard you use that phrase. Law and order to the average American is a a policeman hitting a protester over the head with a stick. That's not what the public wants. They support these protests, and they support the police, and they oppose defunding the police, but they want police reforms. For Trump, it should be called public safety. 
dominating the streets, which is Trump's language, is not what the public wants. They want safe streets and safe neighborhoods. The problem with the Trump campaign is that it is over-amped, over-caffeinated. They're focusing on the right issues that these swing voters want to hear about, but they're using the wrong language. Frank, it's ancient history and therefore probably irrelevant, but is there an analogy to 1968 when we had those riots in Chicago at the Democratic Convention? And Richard Nixon, as I recall, used that to pretty good effect. Yes, and he had a 25-point lead coming out of the two conventions. But on Election Day, and I know you know the numbers, Nixon won by less than 1 percent. Over time, Humphrey was able to communicate to the public that he had empathy, that he had heart. And I believe that what the American people want right now is a hug. They got that from Melania Trump. They got that from Ivanka Trump. But they did not get that from Donald Trump. So you got two messages that the Republicans are using right now. They're not in competition with each other, but they're not necessarily on a parallel track. Frank, you are such a student and expert when it comes to polls. And one of the things we've talked about is uh, how soon do we start looking at the polls? Maybe too early right now. But when will it be time to really pay attention to the polls, number one? And number two, which polls are you going to be focused on? Well, I do this every single day. And I, I'm already, it's already, once you get within 100 days, it's close enough. And actually, over the Labor Day weekend, traditionally, is when a lot of Americans make up their decision. They decide about the economy, they decide about life, they decide about the past, present, and future. So I would tune in about Labor Day. And the poll that I use is Real Clear Politics, which is a poll of polls. But what I do that's a little bit different, I throw out the poll that's most positive for the Democrats, the poll that's most positive for the Republicans, and then I do an average. But one more thing. We do not win or lose based on popular vote. We win or lose based on Electoral College, obviously. But last four years ago and over the last few months, Donald Trump does about two points better in those swing states than he does nationally. So Trump could actually lose the national vote by 3 percent or 4 percent and still win the election. Well, it worked for him more or less in 2016. Is that basically a strategy as far as you can tell? It's a, it, it, uh, it may be his strategy, but obviously the Biden campaign is not going to make the same mistakes as Hillary Clinton. Joe Biden is not as controversial as Hillary Clinton was. But I, I, I'm glad you, you raised that, because the challenge for Biden is that if he starts talking about policy, then he loses the progressives in a state like Michigan or Wisconsin. If he moves too much to the center, he loses the left. If he moves too much to the left, to win those progressives in a state like Florida, then he loses people on the right. So for Biden, the more that it's about personality, the better he does. For Trump, the more it's about issues, the better Trump does. Okay, Frank, thanks so much for being with us. And to see you this time, in addition to hearing from it, it's really great to have you. That's Frank Luntz. He's pollster and founder of Luntz Global. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. Residents across the Gulf Coast are cleaning up and taking stock of the devastation today. Hurricane Laura, the most intense storm to hit the northwestern Gulf Coast since 1856, will result in as much as $12 billion worth of damage to real estate. That's according to estimates, estimates rather from CoreLogic. Laura has been downgraded to a tropical depression. It moved through Arkansas overnight. President Trump heads to New Hampshire tonight, a day after accepting the Republican Party nomination for president. Mr. Trump narrowly lost New Hampshire to Democrat Hillary Clinton in 2016. He is trailing Joe Biden in opinion polls in New Hampshire and nationwide. The president plans to travel extensively in the coming months to boost momentum for his re-election bid. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel is warning her country that the coronavirus pandemic will get worse before it gets better. In her annual summer address, she said the fallout will test Germany's finances for months, if not years, to come. While Chancellor Merkel has been praised for her handling of the pandemic, cracks have started to appear. She has struggled to get state leaders aligned on response measures as infection rates surge. The European Union is urging Turkey to stop its drilling activities in contested waters in the Mediterranean. The EU is also trying to speed up sanctions against Turkish officials involved in the energy exploration. Tensions are growing between Turkey and Greece over Turkey's drilling work near the Mediterranean island of Cyprus, which, like Greece, is an EU member country. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. 
I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. While we've all been focused on the conventions this, these last two weeks, the equity market has been reaching for new record highs. Scarlett Fu is here for an update. That's right, David. It's more of the same, and that was the message from the Federal Reserve when it comes to lower rates, and it's also what we're seeing in terms of price action, which was also helped by better-than-expected economic data. So the S&P rising for a seventh straight day, the dollar weakening versus all the G10 currencies, Treasuries bouncing back from yesterday's sell-off, but the five-year, 30-year part of the yield curve is steepening, and gold is rising as the Fed's willingness to tolerate higher inflation ripples across asset classes. When you look at leadership in equities, also more of the same technology, but it's actually old school tech that's leading the most. Uh, HP, the PC maker, and Western Digital, which makes hard drives, are rising on increased demand for remote work and school. I mentioned the eco data, readings on personal income spending and consumer confidence, all topping estimates. So that is helping to lift cruise ship operators, airlines, resorts. We also have uh, good news on the virus front with Florida's new count case, David, continuing to slow down. So eco data trumps uh, <laughs> convention data at the same time. Markets generally don't like uncertainty very much. Are they pricing in anything? Because this looks like a pretty uncertain election right now from where I sit. Yeah, absolutely. And you've been talking about that with all your guests. And of course, the range of possibilities is fairly endless. You could have extended vote counting, contested results, a blue sweep, a red sweep. We know the VIX has been grinding slower, uh, lower, I should say, since late March. But these are VIX futures contracts, and they show a lot of anxiety. The October futures contract uh, for the VIX, which is the white line, uh, is higher than September and November contracts. The October contracts reflect expectations for volatility from October 21st to November 21st, which covers the election. And this spread between the October contract and the other contracts are higher than in the past three presidential elections. So a lot could happen between now and then, and I suppose to some extent investors are uh, bracing themselves for any kind of scenario. Yeah, including it might not be over November 3rd. We yeah. may be counting mail-in ballots well into December before we're done here. Well, 2000 like, set quite the precedent, so. Yeah, exactly, and this could even be more so as a practical matter. So thank you so much to Scarlett Fu for that report now on the markets. Up next, President Trump talked a lot about what he's done for American jobs, particularly in the manufacturing sector. Nick Pinchuk of Snap-on Tools is here to give us a report from the factory floor. He is the person who employs those people that President Trump cares about so much. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Trump last night emphasized his record on creating jobs, especially for African Americans and Hispanic Americans, and especially in the manufacturing sector, and said it was largely because of his aggressive trade policies. Welcome now someone whose job it is to run one of those manufacturing companies in the battleground state of Wisconsin, no less. Nick Pinchuk is CEO of Snap-on Tools. Nick, it's always a delight to have you on. I want to talk about your business. I want to talk about jobs. But first, since you are in Kenosha, we have to ask, how is it going out there? Give us a report from where things stand right now. Sure, I'm sitting right in Kenosha now. And, you know, uh, I tell you what, Kenosha, these things take on a different perspective when you're right here. Kenosha, you know, hometown, small town, connected people. We've all been uh, traumatized by the events. You know, the, the tragic killing on Sunday, the horrible killings the last couple of days, the burning, the, the firebombing, the, uh, the looting, you know, terrific uh, trauma across the whole community. But, you know, we love this town. We're committed to this town. Snap-on is. Uh, we know the people here. They're, uh, they're hardworking, capable, you know, dedicated. In fact, uh, they've been the wellspring of Snap-on Energy for more than 90 years, so we're committed to them. And one of the, one of the positive things that comes out of all this is the embers are still glowing, and the people in this town are meeting and talking about trying to right the wrongs, trying to re remediate, trying to recover, trying to restore, trying to build for the future. And this is kind of an encouraging thing. 
you can see it. And uh, it speaks to the great people here, but it also talks about the American spirit, the kinds of things you need to deal with uh, hurricanes like Laura, where we have franchisees in their way, or fires like the West Coast, where we have a factory in, in San Jose, or any uh, number of other tragedies or setbacks, or even the COVID, which we're dealing with to develop, uh, to create an economy against the wind in this great ancient evil of, and withering of this great ancient evil. Uh, but people are willing to make fundamental change, do you think? Yeah, you know, I think so. I mean, I think, I think that people are, people are looking at this. I think people are looking at it in terms of what can they do differently. But, you know, it's also the, the idea that, remember, when your town is, is, is burned and you can see the smoke and you worry about it being set back, you worry about that too. The people all over this town are thinking about that. Trauma, I think, is the best way to think about it. There's a hurting but there's an idea that they want to restore because these are salt of the earth people here. Like I said, they've been the, they've been the, uh, the wellspring of our energy for so long. That's why we're committed to being here. And we're going to work with those people to try to figure out how to, to make change and to come back. Nick, let's talk to you also about your business. I mean, we also yeah. have a little thing called a pandemic going on. We've got a recession going on. How is the snap-on business going through this pandemic? Well, you know, let me let me step back and, and say something about the pandemic. I think when I listen to the TV, I hear I hear people talking about the recession through the through the say, through the lens of former recessions, the downturn through the lens of a recession. But it's not like that. If you look at it from the factory floor, you know, those recessions, when you look at them from the factory floor or or our repair garages, we call on three hundred thousand garages and one million technicians, and we have factories all over. Uh, they kind of look at those recessions that have, have been brought upon them by the gnomes of Wall Street. Some kind of enigmatic process brought them down, and only an arcane process uh, with those same gnomes will bring them up, so they don't know really when it's going to come back. But this, this downturn is different. Downturn by fiat. Downturn by something we can identify. And so people are just waiting for the all clear, or at least to be able to deal with things so they can move backwards. And that's what we see. What we're seeing in the snap-on business is the sort of the downturn playing out in three phases. First, the shock. Wow. You know, I, I, I was on Bloomberg, actually, in early March, and then I flew here, was at a Bucks game, 18,000 people in the Milwaukee Bucks, NBA, 18,000 people in the arena. I spoke to several hundred people in a, in, a, in a ballroom the next day, shook 300 hands, and a few days later, people are calling for sheltering in place. And our franchisees and our customers, uh, technicians, didn't know what to do with that. And so for a while, people, franchisees drive, they parked. They didn't know how to deal with their customers. And little by little, you could see the accommodation roll across the nation. And so our business, if you look at, let's say the best way to think about this is the, the, the vans. Everybody knows about our vans. Well, they started out in April really deep in the doldrums, and they gradually came back because they learned how to accommodate the virus, you know, pursue their essential tasks, supporting the economy we love so dear, the society we, we hold so dear, and bear the risks. We say, uh, you know, fear is the, uh, is the destroyer of reason, and so we'll meet fear with fear and uncertainty with vigilance, and that's what they did. So by the end of the quarter, they were within a few percent of last year's number. So you can see that accommodation coming forward. And I think one of the cool things about this is, yeah, we may see a second wave, we may see a third wave, but we will not get shocked again. Well, it's so a Nick, I'm sorry, we just had a, a viewer just write in and say, look, if these people are salt of the earth, that's a compliment. He means that as a compliment. But are people going to be willing to go forward with their business, make those orders and things, if they're not confident that we've got our arms around the coronavirus? Well, that's, that's the psychological recovery. But I, I tell you, just like I think I've talked with many, and I, I wonder if you don't feel this same way, is that... I think, you know, we don't know when it's going to end, but I think it's going to keep getting better because that's what we see. And I think, yes, maybe they'll be re a little bit reluctant to make long-term investments until they, get, until they get confidence. But each each week, actually each day, each week, each month, they get better. And that's why what we're doing is our, our approach to the business is like this. We're going to maintain our strengths. We're going to keep investing in product we have. We keep rolling out new product. We're going to keep supporting our brand. This is the, one of the greatest brands in the world, and we're going to keep working on it. We're going to, we have worked hard to, to maintain our franchisee network and our, and our customer base by extending credit to them through the shock period. We're by that now, and we're going to maintain our people because we think the snap-on people 
are a great advantage, capable, energetic, and dedicated. So we haven't laid off any, anybody. Because what we see coming out of the other side of the recession is people are going to drive more. They're not going to want to depend on shared uh, transportation. They may not want to get on the L in Chicago or the subways in New York, and they may want to even move out of the cities, and that's going to be more driving. So when, when we come out of the recession, when we see this, and we can see it in Shanghai and Beijing, people are driving more. When we can see that, we want to have our product, our brand, our franchisees, our customers, and most of all, our people at full strength. So we're not laying off anybody. So, so Nick, it's pretty clear, Snap-on and your people are very resilient, no question about it. We heard from President Trump last night about what role he may have had on this. Uh, did President Trump have a substantial role in helping you, and particularly in his harsh trade policies? Well, look, I, th I, think, I think trade is <laughs> it kind of faded away a little bit in importance in face of the COVID, but I think it was important. The, the trade policy, I think, was like this. We were all trying to get a better deal out of the a level playing field out of China. It's one of the world's greatest markets and American companies want to take advantage. It's essential for our future. And there were things about intellectual property and the, the, comp, the level playing field in terms of with uh, state owned enterprises and so on. And I think we felt, manufacturers felt, the National Association of Manufacturers felt, how is that going to change? By asking nicely? I think not. So therefore, a kind of a, a little bit more aggressive policy that President Trump took was a good thing. And we, I think the National Association of Manufacturers, was very encouraged by the signing last December. And of course, we're further encouraged by the, uh, by the calls that just been made and moving forward. We'll see how it plays out. But tariffs themselves are something you manage. Even the tariffs, like we, they're like maybe currency or hurricane events or even the COVID. This is our job to try to manage over these things. And so I don't think, I think that the promise of this or the trade policies in the future, if we get a level playing field in China, it's not the immediate effect because I think already manufacturers have managed over it or are not affected by it today. The thing that President Trump did, I think, that was any president can do that is most positive is talk about the actual working men and women, the makers and fixers. Look, today, if you think about it, you buy a, a roll of toilet paper in a, in, a, in a grocery store, and that roll of toilet paper is delivered by a truck driver and manufactured by a guy in a factory, and they cannot work from home. You see, the makers and fixers are the essential people, the frontline workers that have kept our society from dis disintegrating in this period. And one of the things about it is, right. is I don't think they've gotten the respect. And one of the, one of the things is, you know, it's one thing to, to give money it's right. one thing to train them, and we work on training them. We're in, right. we're in more than 2,500 schools right. supporting this kind of training, this technical training. Yeah. But most people view these yeah. kinds of jobs, truck drivers, yeah. mechanics, as having the, yeah. are being the consolation prize of our society, right. Right. when in right. fact this COVID has highlighted that they yeah. are American heroes. Yeah. And if presidents yeah. of any stripe can say that yeah. and celebrate that, then that makes our economy stronger and I think brings us back tremendously and particularly in manufacturing. Yeah. President Trump has right. done that. Nick, you are a positive tonic. There's no question about it. Thank you so much to Nick Pinchuk. He is Snap-on CEO. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. An extradition hearing for a 17-year-old murder suspect in Illinois has been delayed. A judge has postponed Kyle Rittenhouse's hearing until September 25th. Rittenhouse is accused of killing two protesters and wounding a third during protests over the police shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, of Jacob Blake. The teen, who is being charged as an adult in Wisconsin, faces five felony charges, including first-degree intentional homicide and first-degree reckless homicide, which carries a mandatory life sentence. Capping a week of protest and outrage over the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, civil rights advocates are gathering in Washington to commemorate the 1963 March on Washington for jobs and freedom. You're looking at a live picture now. There is Martin Luther King Jr. III, the son of the slain civil rights leader. Thousands are expected at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial where Dr. King delivered his historic I Have a Dream address. The Reverend Al Sharpton, whose organization helped plan today's event, has assembled the families of black men and women who died at the hands of police and ordinary citizens. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Rashard Brooks, Ahmaud Arbery, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Blake, and others. In Japan, the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is calling it quits 
the longest serving prime minister in Japan's history, is resigning to undergo treatment for a chronic illness. Abe's been in office since 2012. His ruling Liberal Democratic Party will pick the next prime minister. Abe is perhaps best known for the program called Abenomics. It was aimed at reviving Japan's economy through unprecedented monetary easing and regulatory reform. Britain wants to make sure its citizens can get a coronavirus vaccine as quickly as possible. The UK is changing its laws to allow the emergency use of any safe and effective vaccine before it is fully licensed. The approval process typically takes months. Britain says this is a precautionary measure and should only would only be used as a last resort. The country has had more than 41,000 COVID-19 deaths, the highest toll in Europe. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Mark. Coming up, we've been paying a lot of attention to politics these last two weeks, but for the markets, it's been all about the Fed. We get an update from our international economics and policy correspondent, Michael McKee. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Both the Republicans and the Democrats have been talking a lot about what they would do for the economy. But so far, at least, it appears to be what the Federal Reserve has to say about monetary policy that's really been driving the financial markets, including speculation about whether it might be close to giving us more forward guidance on rates, something Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan told our colleague Michael McKee today really isn't all that necessary, at least not yet. It's possible that it will take a while to get to 2%. Uh, technology, technology-enabled disruption uh, in particular, are limiting the pricing power of businesses. And, uh, and inflation has been muted for close to 10 years. We welcome now Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee. And, of course, what Rob Kaplan was talking about there was not at all forward guidance. It was whether they can get to 2 percent, Mike. Why don't you tell us what you got? It was a really terrific interview with Kaplan today. Well, he did say that he didn't think it was time to do forward guidance because the economy is still expanding although at a slower pace, and that's the Fed's concern right now. Uh, pretty much everybody on the Fed agrees that what you need to do first is control the virus, and then you'll be able to get people back out and spending. And we saw that in the data that came out today, income and spending. You can see that they are both up, but uh, they are not up a lot, and it has been slowing as we've moved through the summer. This is July data. Uh, June, it opened up and we saw some gains, but now we've started to see a little bit of a fallback. And even in July, unemployment compensation fell 7.2%. So with August and losing that $600 extra unemployment, uh, David, uh, we're going to see e incomes drop even further, which is more of a problem for getting the economy going. At the same time, it seems to not be going as fast as it was before, but I thought Rob Kaplan told you that maybe some of the high frequency data were maybe ticking back up a bit again? Yes, we did see a real decline in July into August, which was the last time we talked to him. And since then, he said mobility data, uh, TSA employments, uh, even restaurant reservations starting to move up again. And of course, he's the central banker in charge of the Houston area. And uh, Houston was one of the hardest hit cities, Texas, one of the hardest hit states during the month of July. So things are getting a little better. Now, this is an interesting chart on the other data point that came out today. That's the University of Michigan sentiment. It's still relatively relatively strong, unlike the conference board data, which dropped. But you can see there's a big difference depending on the party you belong to. The red line are Republicans, the blue line are Democrats. Yeah. And while if you look at the far right hand yeah. side, while everybody thought things were bad right. in the early part, it's jumped up a little bit more for yeah. Republicans. Two different countries, even when we look at how we look at the economy. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Michael McKee. We're going to have much more on the economy tonight on Wall Street Week. That's at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And coming up here, we're going to have more of my conversation with Home Depot co-founder Ken Langone. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Investor, philanthropist, Home Depot co-founder. Ken Langone is an unapologetic capitalist. The title of his memoir is actually, I Love Capitalism. But when I talked with him, he emphasized that it wasn't just capitalism that works. It's what he called responsible capitalism. I think it's happening right now. I think sound, solid business people are going to come to that conclusion. I'm bragging about Home Depot, okay? I'm bragging. I have a reason to brag because in this last quarter, we gave out $640 million, $680 million to our associates. Full-time people got as much, depending on the years of service, as 24, uh, no, they got, uh, they got uh, 240, no, I'm wrong. They got uh, 12 weeks with pay. They can take the money or they can take the time off. We paid people if they felt they were at risk, if they didn't come in. We restricted the number of people that could shop in our store at one at one time. We cut store hours. Where we had stores where the high rate of absenteeism was such, we shut the stores and only allowed for online purchasing through that store. These were all decisions that we made that negatively impacted the bottom line. By the way, that $680 million does not include our success sharing program where we have a bonus every six months for each store based on their results relative to plan. That didn't also include store managers' bonuses. Again, that's sacred to our culture. So we did that for two reasons. We could have made a lot more money if we didn't do it. In other words, if we didn't kept the stores open, the service would have been bad. More importantly, the most important thing of all, our, our associates and our customers' health risk would have been substantially higher. We took the position, we're going to do what's right for people, our customers, our associates. And if it impacted negatively, the bottom, we still did okay on the bottom line. I mean, I'm, we're not complaining. The point is, we didn't maximize profits. We didn't maximize profits. Uh, we have a program. Where in the last five years, I believe, we gave somewhere between 250 million and 500 million dollars to veterans programs. We did that for one reason: it's the right thing to do. And we live, we live amidst these veterans. These are many of them are our customers. So we made a decision. Now, by the way, this lunch I had with our store managers the other day, they were talking about people imitating what we do. And he said something that made me feel so good. He said, the one thing that's going to be hard to copy is our culture. You know, look at, look at our results. Look at, look at the low turnover of our people. Look at how competitive we are with salaries. Look at the benefit plans we have. Eli Lilly, the same thing. Johnson & Johnson, the same thing. Triple M. All these forward, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, all of them, all of them have made major efforts to share their good fortune with their people and with the societies in which they live and work. We're not back to the old robber barons. We're not back to let them eat cake. That's gone. Now, to a lot of companies, it's not gone. But to enlightened, forward-looking companies, they're doing the right thing. Not just Home Depot, not just Home Depot, everybody. Those companies that choose to be a modern, vibrant business are making these decisions. And it's for the benefit of everybody. And Ken, in your experience, on average over time, there are always exceptions, do nice guys and gals finish first in the business world? That is to say, do we need the government to encourage this kind of behavior, or will it, will it take its own course and really spread because it leads to success? Based on history, anything the government touches, it screws up. Okay? Let the laws of supply and demand. Home Depot does all these things because of its, its part of our values. But as we take a step back, we say, wow, 
look at what we did. For example, one of our tenants, if we want all the people, nobody works for us, they all work with us. That's a mindset. The kid that works, the new kid that starts today, he works with us, he doesn't work for us. And we collectively work for the customer. But how we have today, the proudest statistic of all, we have today, David, 3,000 kids. And by the way, I tell them, if you're under 84, you're a kid. I'm going to be 85 next month. So if you're under 84, don't be mad at me, you're a kid. We have 3,000 kids that started with us pushing carts in the parking lot. But a multimillionaires today, they have Home Depot stock. That was part of my interview with Ken Langone, Home Depot co-founder. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk with Richard Trumka, AFL-CIO president, and Carla Fiorina, former Republican presidential candidate. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.